Hi, welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former merchant mariner, and an instructor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Man, I can't tell you what craziness is going on in the shipping and maritime industry. I, I mean, I, I try to focus every broadcast on a single news story or subject, but I have to tell you that there is a world of things going on right now and it's really hard to concentrate on just one topic and so what i want to do is kind of do a little cavalcade we'll run you through a story that i saw that I, I thought was really interesting because of its historical connotation i'm a historian after all love the hist history and then i thought i'd run you through what is going on right now so this is a story that came out in freight waves and it's a flashback to looking at uh, a story that they did in American Shipper. American Shipper was a magazine uh, that they ran for a very long time. Uh, but this looks back to the year 2000. And it looked at, back at the Drury Shipping Report. Now, Drury is in, uh, uh, kind of an analytical group. And they do research and reports, uh, for example, right here. Uh, this is their uh, index right here, the World Container Index, as of 22 July. And so they track every aspect of supply chain. And so like one of the things that this chart shows, apologize, I gotta put my glasses on to show you this, is it shows you the World Container Index assessed by Drury for price per 40 foot container. And right now it's sitting at just under $9,000 per box. Go back to 25 July of 2019, it is $1,250. So it gives you the idea of the scope and scale of this rise. You see here right at the end of 2020, it leaped up, and then all of a sudden here in May, uh, you see it just it's just been on the climb ever since. And they do these great kind of reports and everything like that. They, they've just put out their uh, annual review and forecast, Global Container Terminal Operators Annual Review and Forecast. And if you have $2,750, you can buy this. Uh, I can tell you right now, I, I don't have access to this. Uh, this is a lowly associate professor's YouTube channel. Uh, you see the entire staff here at uh, what's going on with shipping. So uh, I don't have access to this, uh, but it has great information and great material, I'm sure, and, and gives you a, a, a ton of, of data. And there's a lot of these uh, uh, groups out there that do this. But this story in Freight Waves goes back to 2000 when they're talking about how world port reach is 201 million TEUs. So in the year 2000, they're talking about hitting that that peak right there <clears throat> of 201 uh, million TEUs. They're talking about the change right here. They're, they're showing that change right there. They're showing how many containers are being uh, moved from 186,000 in 1988 up to 201,000 in 1999. Just uh, an amazing increase that you see happening right there. And they break it down a little bit uh, in this story. And the reason I, I, I bring it up again is because where we're at right now in terms of global shipping. So I follow up that Drury story with this one from Splash 24-7, where here you, know, here you have the, the historical report from 2000. We've just hit 201 million TEUs in the year 2000. And now here you go, uh, indexed and capacity through 2025. And what they're talking about here is Drury's latest Global Container Terminal Operators Annual Review. That's that uh, um, brochure I just showed you there, the, the, the research uh, manual for $2,750. Uh, predicts global container port capacity will increase by an average of 2.5% to reach 1.3 billion TEU by 2025. So again, by 2025, we're on track to be 1.3 billion containers moving around the world. We were at... 200 million in the year 2000. So in the span of 25 years, you've increased now fivefold. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, pretty impressive in how we move goods. And this has had a huge amount of ramifications. And looking at stories over the past week, there's a few that, that, that hit me. I just want to kind of highlight them because they go into this context about this growth of containerization and global shipping. So uh, G Captain has run a whole series of these stories. Uh, there, there's a batch of them on here. This is the homepage here at G Captain. Uh, there's an interesting story if you're if you're interested in it uh, about the fire on the Bonhomme Richard back last year. I did a series of videos on them. I'll put them in the uh, in the show notes 
on the fire. And I'm actually quoted in this story. Uh, one of the issues uh, the Navy is looking at is what to do to prevent fires like the Bonham Richard from happening again. And one of the big things is get a fire boat, get a boat that fights fires. There's none in San Diego. It was a big problem. But anyway, that's not the story I want to show you. Focus on. Here's a couple of stories. Each of these are interesting for a variety of reasons. China announces largest home-built cruise ship. So, Sal, we're talking about containers. Why are you talking about cruise ship? China, Japan, South Korea are in a fight for shipbuilding. They're, they're in a, a just a hold, no holds bar. I mean, they, they produce about 94% of all the world's ships, and they are in a massive contest to do that. And outside of those three nations, basically what you see is specialized shipping. One of those areas of specialized shipping is in the cruise ship industry. And cruise ships are being built in, in France, in, in Finland, in Turkey, in Italy, uh, at, at Chantier, at, at Turku, uh, um, uh, Fincantieri. All these yards are building them. However, China sees an opportunity here because of the slowdown in the cruise ship industry there's an opportunity here. Cruise ship industries have pushed out some of their long-term vessels. They couldn't stop them all, but they're pushing out vessels longer. But if the cruise industry all of a sudden kicks back and they need more vessels quickly, China's hoping to capitalize on this. And th that's a big issue here in terms of shipbuilding, because one of the things they're trying to do is control the shipbuilding industry in the Far East. This story right here, global container port capacity will struggle to catch up with rising demand. I mean, we're seeing this throughout the world. There are numerous stories in, in G Captain and Splash 247, in Freight Waves, uh, you name it, where, where we're talking about the fact that ports are just jammed. They're just jammed. They, they cannot move any faster. One of the things that containerization was meant to do was to increase the flow of, con of goods. Success. Thumbs up, Malcolm McLean. You did a great job, Malcolm McLean. The problem is no one envisioned this growth, this this large right now. And the problem is beyond concentrating containers into a few carriers now, you know, 10 top carriers handle 85% of all the containers in the world. We've also concentrated the ports and you can't get these container ships into anything but these large mega ports. And that has caused problems because these ports have to have rail road connections out of them. And what we're seeing is jam in there they're jammed in there it's very difficult to get goods out we just talked about the story about the trains in the western part of the united states union pacific basically slowing down there's another story that the wildfires have shut down some of the rail lines going out of northern california heading up into the northwest part of the united states and now trains have to literally go all the way almost to the mississippi and circle around to get from california up to the washington and idaho coast so even if you take your vessels, for example, and bypass Los Angeles and Long Beach, and you go into Oakland, or if you go into Portland, or if you go into uh, Seattle, Tacoma, or Vancouver, it doesn't do you any good because you can't get your containers back down the southern, southern side of California where the population is. You got to get the goods to where the people are. And if you don't have the rail lines, that's a big problem. And what we're seeing here is this issue. Uh, they talk about it here in the story real quick here. Uh, uh, they talk about here uh, uh, in today's HMM terminal status update, the South Korean carrier reports serious delays, congestions for vessels, birthing and yard and gate issues at the majority of its port calls. HMM is one of the largest carriers right now. They have the largest ships out there right now. And it's a classic catch 22 carriers have been highly critical of the ports for the delays, but the ports blame the shipping lines for not meeting their birthing windows. So, I mean, both sides are blaming each other here. And the issue here is demand is such that, the suppliers can't keep up. And when you do, when that happens, what you do is you jack up the freight rates. Go back over here to Drury's little chart here. This is why freight rates are just escalating. It's such a huge rate right there. You just see them going up at this massive rate. Now, the other issue you have going on here, and again, I, I hate to throw a lot of stories at you, but again, I like to kind of weave these together into, into what's going on. We've got COVID-19 going on. Now, COVID-19 and the new variant, the Delta and the Lambda variants are out there. And unfortunately, mariners have been given low priority until recently to get vaccinations. Now, they're just starting to do this. Now, when ships come into U.S. ports, they're getting vaccinated. But overseas, they're not. And more importantly, this is causing a problem in crew rotations. It's very difficult to get crews off. You'll hear a lot of people advocate for ending U.S. shipping in the United States, the things like the Jones Act and everything. But the problem with that is if you bring in foreign crews, you got to be able to rotate those crews. 
And right now you can't do crew rotations in the United States very easily uh, because one of the things the U.S. requires, if you want to get off your vessel and out of an enclosed mega harbor, mega port terminal like L.A. Long Beach, you need a visa. You need to go get a visa. Well, you can't get a visa in your home country because all the U.S. State Department embassies are closed. And so this just makes crew change difficult. And what's happening is people are serving longer on vessels than they need to. One of the most unsung groups in the COVID story has to be the plight of the mariners right now. And that issue is going on. But what we're also seeing is when COVID is striking, it's starting to hit these vessels. There's a story again here in G-Captain of a Delta, crate, uh, Delta case on board a ship off New Zealand. Now, New Zealand has been absolutely just on COVID-19. They shut the islands down, you know, the North and South Islands, very small population, but they shut down. And you do not get in that country uh, uh, with it during uh, uh, back in March. Uh, when I was talking about Ever Given, I did an interview on a New Zealand news point, and I talked about going to New Zealand. They said, well, you'll, you'll, you'll be in the hotel for two weeks because everybody comes in and gets quarantined. They have no cases at all. And now here's a container ship that has an outbreak on board, and they're holding it at Anchorage. They're not letting it come in. And, and this has the potential to, again, catastrophically butterfly effect down the supply chain. And we see that happening. And so this is an isolated case. It's one container ship in New Zealand. But what happens when we start seeing these vessels start coming into other ports and you can't move them on berth? And again, there's a small vessel going into New Zealand, but still you can see it magnified. I need there are weather in this. Uh, if you didn't catch it, there was a huge typhoon came rolling through. This massive typhoon came rolling through, uh, hit China. Uh, internally in China, there's massive issues going on in China. I don't know why we're not watching more of this. Uh, floods, dams busting, poor food production right now. China is absolutely paranoid about certain issues and sustaining itself is number one. It's one of the reasons for the whole Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the whole thing that uh, Xi Jinping set up in 2013 and which is going to be in full force uh, by the time you get to the centenary of, of the People's Republic of China in 2049 is to have the Belt and Road Initiative in place, where China will not just have land routes, but maritime routes, but not just singular routes, but multiple routes. Uh, there was a, a story about a train uh, going from Shanghai all the way into Europe, uh, carrying goods. But here we see the Shanghai, uh, Shanghai port shut down because uh, Typhoon Infa slammed into the East China. And we saw this weather disruption take place. Uh, add to it, we know that there's COVID outbreaks in places like Vietnam off of uh, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, formerly Saigon. Vung Tau, which is the outport for Ho Chi Minh City, has been shut down. And again, we've seen a lot of shift out of China to Southeastern Asian countries, and now we see it with Vietnam. We're still dealing with the outbreak in India, which is causing massive crew rotation problems. All this comes to say that our supply net, maritime supply net, is under a lot of stress and strain. And what that means is, you know, there, there are stories all the time. This is container news where, you know, they just talked about the fact that, you know, I talked about the riots uh, that took place in South, uh, South America. Well, there was a cyber attack in South America that knocked systems off. So not only do you start opening the ports back up, but now all of a sudden you have a cyber attack that knocks everything off. Uh, we're seeing escalating freight rates. Again, again, go, go into the freight news. You just see these freight rates increasing. New rates for South Asia to Europe. Hop Hog Lloyd announcing new rates uh, to uh, Australia. All these rates are going up. Goes back to this Drury index right here where we're seeing the average cost increase. And what this is is a whole deal with – Goods going up, but also mass. One other issue that came out in GCAP and that I really want to make you aware of. So this is the last story, and this kind of links a lot of this together. This is a story by the uh, uh, CEO of GCAP, John Conrad, who I know. And it's entitled, it's about stimulus checks, not ocean carriers, like Mayor says, White House source. So this story goes in and, and talks about the fact that recently the government has put a lot of emphasis on the Federal Maritime Commission, the Department of Justice, to look into these control of freight rates, the escalating costs, 
of everything. And, and I've talked about this. You know, I, I think the fact that 85% of, of container trade is concentrated in 10 companies is a problem. I think that's a big issue. But what this story talks about is the fact that that's actually not the big issue. The bigger issue is the fact that we're dealing with inflation now, that we're dealing with the increased cost of goods. It's not whether there's more competition out there because the system is at capacity. The issue here is we're dealing with inflation. And this story goes in here and talks about it. I really recommend you take a look at it. I think it's a, it's a really good one. And it starts to link together a lot of these other stories that are going on. So what we're seeing right now in, in global shipping is a, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, with uncertainty comes risk. With, uncertain, with risk comes opportunity. Uh, I know a lot of people have made a lot of money in shipping right now, uh, um, betting on bulk carriers and tankers and container ships. Uh, it, it's, I will tell you, I don't, do that too often because I think it's 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 the market's extremely finicky and it's also dependent on so many factors that it's very hard to factor in. But for you, the normal consumer on YouTube who's watching this video, what does it matter to you? You may have started noticing some shortages on the shelves. Not like we had at the beginning of COVID, but you may notice some goods missing. You may notice that you know some some things are taking a little bit longer. There's not as much a selection in the Home Depots or the big box stores that there was, and and goods are taking longer to be delivered to you by your Amazon drones, and and you know all these things are are taking a bit longer, and it all has to do with this issue in global shipping. And again, it goes back to that episode I had where we talked about the pairs going from Argentina to Thailand back to the United States. Uh, when you put pressure on the system, it has to give a little bit. And when we're used to getting our goods, you know, like that in a snap of a finger, and now all of a sudden it's slowed down, that causes problems. And so I'm going to keep watching this, uh, keep kind of dissecting this, see the stories that make sense, kind of, you know, CSI maritime news together for you all and see if I can make some more sense of this. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please subscribe to the channel. Go ahead, give it a thumbs up. So it'll be shared across YouTube. Uh, also be sure to hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. And also feel free to share the video across social media with your friends and everybody so they'll see the videos. I am working on a video right now on uh, a certain aspect of American shipping, which I think is very interesting. Uh, I also gave a talk recently to the Propeller Club of Washington, D.C. on America's first maritime strategy. And I'm going to put that talk together and post it for people to watch or not to watch up to you. Uh, and then uh, if any suggestions or anything like that, please put them in the uh, comment boxes. And I try to read and, and answer back all the comments that I get. So this is Sal signing off.